Wie schön, dass ihr wieder auf unserem Brückenkanal Autismus, was nun dabei seid und ihr euch dafür die Zeit nehmt. Mein Name ist Anja Klinger. Ich bin Inklusionspädagogin und Sozialarbeiterin im Bereich Autismus. Und ich bin Melanie Matzis Köhler, arbeite seit fast 23 Jahren jetzt schon mit Menschen im Autismus-Spektrum, bin Diplompsychologin, Fachberaterin und Autorin. In dieser Folge erwartet euch eine so wunderbare, kraftvolle Frau. Und zwar ist es Temple Crandon. Es ist sehr besonders, sie hier im Gespräch zu haben. Und wir sind so unendlich dankbar, mit so einer inspirierenden Persönlichkeit sprechen zu dürfen. Temple Crandon zählt zu den 100 einflussreichsten Frauen in den USA. Sie hat etliche Bücher veröffentlicht. Ihr Leben wurde im Jahre 2010 verfilmt. Sie ist heute 75 Jahre alt. In Berlin ist eine Schule nach ihr benannt. Sie ist seit vielen Jahren Dozentin für Tierwissenschaften an der Colorado State University in Port Collins und als Expertin hält sie Vorträge über Autismus. Und darüber sprechen wir heute auch mit Temple Crandon über Autismus. We are so grateful and so excited to have a such powerful woman in our interview today. Thank you very much for your time. I want to go back to the moment when you have realized that you are a special child. Could you tell us more about this moment? Well, I can then like to start out um, saying what I'm doing right now. I'm a professor of animal science at Colorado State University. I've been there for 33 years doing um, livestock behavior research, um, uh, mentoring graduate students. Um, I've got I've put about 22 graduate students through master's and PhD programs where they completed. Really, really happy about that. Three of my students have become professors, which also makes me really happy. And when I was um, four years old, I had no speech. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of early intervention for little kids that are not speaking. You know, if you've got a two-year-old or three-year-old that's not talking, the worst thing you can do is to do nothing. You've got to start working with that child now. In speech therapy, other kinds of therapies, with a good teacher who gets that child to interact. Uh, also, you want to teach turn-taking. These kids need to learn how to wait and take turns at games. And then basic skills like getting dressed, um, brushing their teeth, just basic skills. But you need to get working with three-year-olds. Worst thing you can do is wait. You know, we have some parents in the U.S. It takes two years to get a diagnosis. You already know the child doesn't talk. You need to do something now. Rule out deafness. Rule out a physical problem with the mouth or something like that. And you need to get working on them now. And you don't let them spend all day just uh, spacing out on electronics. In my daily work with non-speaking preschool children on autism spectrum, I experience the following situation. Many parents with non-speaking children who listen to this interview now want nothing more for their children to be able to speak. We know your mother supported your childlessly every day. What advice can you give these parents? You need to start working with the child really early. The two-year-old is not speaking. You need to start working now. I was in a very good educational program at two and a half with a lot of one-to-one -one instruction with an effective teacher. Okay, what's an effective teacher? More speech, more ability to wait and take turns at games, and learning basic skills. And what my speech teacher would do is she'd hold up a cup mm -hmm. and she'd say cup, and then she would say it really slow, cup, bah. Because if the grown-ups talk too fast, it went in, and I couldn't understand what they're saying. So the teacher needs to slow down when they talk to these little kids. And they need lots of um, interaction with an effective teacher. You start early. That improves the prognosis. But again, it's never too late to start. But don't wait two years if you have a two-year-old that's not talking. 
Can I jump in? In Germany, they don't really like ABA. So you wouldn't say that ABA is a bad therapy concept, you would say, you approve of it? There's all kinds of ABA. And there's some old-fashioned, rigid ABA that really was bad mm -hmm. that some of the older advocates got subjected to. And the much more modern programs, they have sensory uh, uh, activities involved in it with an occupational therapist, you know, more speech therapy, doing things in a much more natural environment and not so rigid. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think with two-year-olds, eye contact that important because that tends to overload the nervous system. I want speech. I want ability to wait and take turns at games. I had a huge emphasis on that. So it teaches the child to wait, and I want skills, toothbrushing, eating with utensils, that sort of stuff. And uh, you always want to give the child the opportunity to use their language. Okay, so you know that the child wants the juice. You say, now use your words. And you have to give them time to respond. These kids are like a phone with a bad uh, cell service, with a bad service. Takes time for it to download the web page. Takes time for the brain to respond. It's slow processing speed. Okay, because of course an autistic child's communication impaired. You know, some of these diagnoses are, uh, well, in the U.S. we call it splitting hairs, where, where, um, you know, years ago, they used to call autism, uh, you know, the, the kid was you know, intellectually impaired. Um, they, the, bottom, the most important thing, little kids, two-year-olds are not talking, don't wait. Rule out deafness and rule out cleft palate. Uh, there's something called tongue tie, some things like that that can be surgically corrected. And get working with the kid, period. I don't really care what the diagnosis is. The okay. therapies are pretty much the same for little children that are not talking. Thank you very much. Okay, another situation that I always encounter when children on autism spectrum get angry, the parents often try to calm their children with cell phones, for example. What can you say about this phenomena? Well, it depends how old the child is. Um, when I was maybe eight years old in primary school, if I had a temper tantrum, the rule was the same at home and school. There'd be no television for one night for having a temper tantrum. Now, sometimes a child may scream because of a loud noise. And I was not punished for, um, you know, the noise sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And, okay, if the screaming is caused by noise sensitivity, one of the ways you can help the child is to take the thing that makes the noise, let the child control it. Okay, hair dryers, vacuum cleaners. Let the child turn that vacuum cleaner on and off where they control it. And when they control it, they may be better able to tolerate the noise and the vacuum cleaner may start being a fun thing. That's a very, very simple thing to do. Take the noise and let them control it. Now, things like dogs barking, I can't control that. So you'd have to use an audio recording that the child could control. And that needs to be a high quality audio recording. Yeah. That's a very good idea. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay, then I have a couple of other questions. One regarding women on the spectrum. There have been many, many changes in diagnosis the recent years. Broader, the, the spectrum is much broader. And re, uh, gender research has found that there are far more women on the spectrum than we originally expected. So from your point of view, what are the main differences between men and women? And have you ever found any structural brain differences? Not really, no. They, the thing is, the problem with the autism diagnosis, it's a behavioral profile. And over the years, doctors have been changing it. See, it's not like tuberculosis, where you either have tuberculosis or you don't have it. It's a behavioral profile. Now, back in the 80s, to be autistic, you had to have speech delay along with the autistic symptoms. Then in 1994, they added the Asperger's, which is basically socially awkward with no speech delay. And then in, in 2013, they merged it all together. So now you have this huge spectrum going from Einstein and Silicon Valley programmers to people that, that adults that never learned to dress themselves. This huge, huge, huge spectrum. 
Now, oftentimes women just don't show the symptoms as much as men do. Hmm. Um, <coughs> it might be related to less lateralized brain. You know, there's some stroke research that shows that if a man loses the the language area to stroke, that he's not going to talk. Where a girl can lose a, lose a, some of that language area, maybe the other side of the brain it can take over. They're less lateralized. That might explain it. And when, it, because they're less uh, less lateralized in the brain. But one of the big problems found with women on the spectrum is abusive relationships. That's a, mm -hmm. a, a big problem. They so much want to have a relationship that they'll tolerate an abusive relationship when they need to be telling the guy to just go away. Yeah. Dominant guys, for example, who tell them what to do, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. That is right. That's an interesting aspect, yeah. And when we speak about it's not just women, but also men are concerned when you get older. So um, the topic of autism in old age, we've never really touched that topic in Germany, not so far. So my question would be, how do you experience autism in old age? Is Well, I think that I'm way past retirement age, but I'm still working because I wouldn't know what to do with myself if I wasn't working. And mm -hmm. and I've thought about what happens if I have end up on a walker or something. I've thought about that. And I can't travel anymore. Well, maybe I can still be a, be a tour guide at the local science museum and explain the science exhibits to the kids. Because I've got to have something to do. You know, this the other thing that's been a big problem for people as they get older, they might have been in a real stable job for years. Then the company gets sold. And they go to a new place and doesn't work out well with a new boss. That can be a, an issue. That is um, changing bosses at work. That's a dangerous time. If you have a boss that doesn't understand how to work with you. Because one of the things for me at work is I cannot remember long strings of verbal instruction. And, and so any task that involves sequence, I'm going to need to make a checklist. Step one, step two, step three, step four, sort of like a pilot's checklist because I've got very poor working memory. Mm -hmm. And I've had bosses say, well, I just explained to them five times how to clean the ice cream machine and uh, they don't remember. This is where a checklist is needed. And then clear instructions on what the, what the job is. Vagueness doesn't work. So I've seen situations where somebody in their 50s or 60s um, You know, they no longer have their job. And that's that's a big mess. Hmm. So it's very important to keep being occupied and to do something with old age. Well, the other big problem I'm seeing is too many autistic kids and teenagers, I'm talking fully verbal ones here, getting kind of babied. And they're not learning working skills because working skills are very different than academic skills. They have to learn how to do tasks outside the family on a schedule. And it could be something as simple as walking the next door neighbor's dog, where they're doing the task for somebody outside the family. That, that's really important. It could be a volunteer job at a church or at a community center or some other thing. Learning the work skills. I'm seeing too many teenagers fully verbal have never gone shopping by themselves. They're not learning budgeting and banking, just basic things. Hmm. Some parents take that from them, so they take it over. Well, parents do too much for them. I'm seeing that. You know, and I also see a lot of grandparents come up to me, and they discover they're autistic when the kids get diagnosed. But the grandparent had a paper route when they were a kid. They were entrepreneurial. I just was talking the other day to a girl when she was like 12 years old. Uh, there was a charity event, and she set up a booth to paint people's nails. You know, that was just an entrepreneurial thing that she did. See, those are really good experiences that, you know, kids can do even before legal working age, where they're learning to do something that other people, you know, use a skill that other people want and appreciate. Can you tell us more about your thinking? All my <laughs> thoughts are in photorealistic pictures. And if you saw the HBO movie about me titled Temple Grandin, 
it shows how I think in pictures. Well, years ago, when I wrote my autobiography, <laughs> Thinking in Pictures, um, oh, good, you've got the... the uh, uh, it's the German version. It's well, the first that's edition that's of one of your... Oliver, that's the Oliver Sacks book. <laughs> that, yeah, that's right. the article that Oliver Sacks wrote about me. Thinking in Pictures is my autobiography that I wrote in 1995, originally. And okay. I described how <laughs> I think in pictures... I used old-fashioned technology like a VCR. Nobody knows what a VCR is now. A video cassette recorder in my head. I think about going to the grocery store, which I'm going to be doing this morning. I've got to pick up a prescription. I am now seeing the pharmacy. And then I'm now seeing the grading closed because I went there between 1 and one thirty when it's closed. You see, that's kind of associated thinking. So everything I think about is a picture. and not all people that are autistic think in pictures. And this is something I discuss in my brand new book, Visual Thinking, The Hidden uh, Gifts okay. of People Who Think in Pictures, Patterns, and Abstractions. And some autistic people are object visualizers, where they think completely in pictures. So they're going to be good at mechanical things, art, photography, and animals, and be very, very bad at algebra. I worked with many. Um, people that had many mechanical inventions and they couldn't do algebra. And then you have your mathematical mind, your visual spatial mathematical mind that thinks in patterns. This is your music and math person. These people think in patterns. And then of course you have verbal thinkers that think in words. And I didn't know that verbal thinking existed until I was in my late thirties. And I was shocked to find out that some people don't have visual images in their head. Now, what tends to happen in autism is you can get an extreme visual thinker or an extreme mathematician. A lot of people on this, uh, regular people are mixtures of the different kinds of thinking. And the scientific research behind this is in my book, um, Visual Thinking. Uh, you can okay. find it, you just type the title and my name yes. into the into the book sites or into Amazon. You know, it's just Temple Grandin, visual thinking. Um, and there's research on these different kinds of thinking. And I think that um, some differences in the educational systems explain why Germany and Holland and Italy and other companies like this excel in specialized mechanical equipment. Because when the individuals in uh, starting high school they can decide between going university or tech route. And right now, if I want poultry processing equipment, I need to buy it from Holland. Mm, okay. or a lot of food processing equipment is coming out of Italy. And what's happening in the U.S. is that a lot of the people that cannot do the higher math are just getting screened out. But the people who are not able to do the higher math are the ones that invent a lot of mechanical equipment. I'm a big proponent of developing a kid's area of strength. Now, the only way you're going to find out a child's area of strength is exposure. Okay, if a child's good with musical instruments, they'd have to be exposed to musical instruments. My ability in art was always encouraged. You know, one of the mistakes that's been made in some educational systems is taking out hands-on classes like art, sewing, music, woodworking, cooking, all of these these uh, hands-on classes, because there are also places where a child can develop their something they might be good at that can become a, a job when they grow up when i spent a year in the states it's a long long time ago 30 30 years ago or something okay, like that that's, a long, that's yeah. a long time i was in washington state in olympia and i went to high school and they had classes like creative cooking and keyboarding and um literature and and things like that and i was very amazed because we don't have anything like that in germany we don't have any creative cooking class or crafts or arts that way um well, what about what about things like uh metal working shop and auto mechanics do you have those classes no no i think it's a mistake because what's happening with the equipment like especially food processing equipment, things that I know about, it's coming out of Holland and Italy. That's where it's coming out. And it's what I call the clever engineering department. 
You want to mm. see an example of it, you can look up the Apollo chicken harvester on YouTube. There's a <laughs> machine that picks up chickens. Okay. And, cool. and that's an example of what I call clever engineering. And these are often the kids that excel in a shop class. And in higher math, they're bad. There's two parts of engineering. There's a higher math part. And then there's what I call the clever engineers. They're the ones that invent all kinds of mechanical things. And we've taken a lot of these classes out of our schools. Mm. And we're now starting to put some of them back in. Because we're realizing that they, of the skill loss. Holland also is the manufacturer of the state-of-the-art electronic chip making machine or electronic chips. And and I have a whole chapter in visual thinking on skill loss. And I've looked up the educational system in Italy. You can go university, tech, or art for their fashion industry. Hmm. That's what they do in Italy. And it there's things where you might we have kids getting uh, just kind of pushed into special ed when they ought to be out building things. Hmm. Yeah. You see, a visual thinker has a different approach to problem solving than a mathematical thinker. A so very different approach to problem solving. There should be more offers for different type of thinkers, probably. Well, so when I was a child in the U.S., um, that would be in the 50s, I took um, sewing, woodworking, and art. I actually hated cooking. Sewing, woodwork, and art I loved. and and those skills were always encouraged. And then when I, you know, uh, work that I'm doing now, I worked on um, designing uh, cattle handling facilities. And then a person that I know is autistic, he's designed equipment in, in a beef plant that's used in every single large beef plant. Hmm. And, and he's definitely undiagnosed autistic. But he grew up working on cars. Or another person I worked on uh, had a welding class in high school. Now he's got a big business and a corporate jet, and he builds beef plants. Thanks to that welding class he had in high school. I think it needs more op opportunities for the different thinking you told about. Thinking of pictures, thinking of math, thinking That's of... right. And it needs the opportunities for all this different thinking yeah. well if you have a young child let's say eight years old who's really really good at math then he needs to be or she needs to be moved ahead in math yes that was done with Catherine johnson the famous lady that did the calculations for the um for space flights in the u.s her math education was handled right she had some horrible discrimination against her but her math education was done right and she was moved ahead in math so she could display her, her you know, brilliance in math. Oh, and okay. the calculations that she did on those early space flights before there were computers, you know, might mm -hmm. were absolutely essential. But so it needs adults to really, really look carefully for talents, for um, uh, interests, special interests of the children. You have to, how do you develop special interests? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to be exposed to things to develop interest. I just talked to a parent the other day at the airport who came up to me, and, it, and they, there was a child that loves uh, mountain biking. This is riding bikes with big, uh, strong tires for riding out in the woods and up in the mountains. And the autistic, uh, now he's turning a young man, loves mountain biking, worked in a mountain biking shop. Okay, now that's a special interest that can turn into a really good career. It's also an interest socially where that individual can get friends who shared interests because there's other people that are interested in, like, in mountain biking mm -hmm. and their whole um, career revolves around that. that. And I was, um, I was at, the air, at the airport ice cream stand eating chocolate ice cream and the lady came up to me and I said, you absolutely need to be um, encouraging that interest because that's a really good thing that can become a good career. Uh, but how would you get interested in mountain bikes if you were never exposed to them? Because hmm. what I'm finding on the career thing, it starts with exposure. 
I have um, profiled Michelangelo. He was a little 12-year-old school dropout, but he was exposed to great art. All the churches were commissioning it. And then he also grew up with stone cutting tools. See, that's exposure. And then when some artists saw how good he was, they pulled him into a studio and apprenticed him. Mm. You see, so mm. it's exposure, then mentoring. Okay. okay. First I mean, it wouldn't have been any David uh, if if Mikey hadn't grown up with stone cutting tools. That's wonderful, isn't it? So yes. first exposure and then... And then mentoring. And then mentoring. That was the word I was going to use. Yeah, that, that's... But it, it, I, I was exposed to a little flute when I was a child. I could never figure out how to play it. I was exposed to musical instruments, but it didn't work for me. Mm. But for another child, they're going to pick up that flute and they're going to just play it. Mm. And uh, you expose kids to lots of different things, then you can kind of see what they gravitate towards. Is it going to be more mathematics? Um, okay, computer programming. Uh, I've got a student right now that's having to learn how to do the computer programming for statistics right now. Mm -hmm. She's just got to sit down this weekend and learn it. But I'm seeing too many of these kids where they'll say, well, we can't let this kid take a shop class, for example, because he's in special ed and we're worried about safety. Well, I know people that would be diagnosed with autism today and they own the shops. Mm -hmm. And they're mostly in retirement age now. The elder people that we have in Germany, there are so many who are getting now, getting diagnosed now and are like in my age, 50, 60 years old. And uh, when they get, when they're getting this late diagnosis now, um, is there an advice for them how to deal with with the future? I mean, there are no facilities. There's nothing in Germany where people can go to or um Would you say that some of the symptoms, some of the autistic symptoms? Oh, okay. One, okay, for this older person, mm -hmm. what's the main reason that they're getting diagnosed? You're talking well, about somebody in their 60s? 50s, What? 40s, 50s. 50s, yeah. okay. Yeah. Well, there's a book I've got here, Different Not Less. This is 18 people diagnosed later in life. And they tell their stories in their own words. I was the editor of this book. And they all have jobs, and they and uh, where the diagnosis helped them was with their relationships, different, not less, and by Temple Grandin. But hmm. I just wrote the forward, and I picked out the people, and we they talk about their childhood, and they talk about getting the diagnosis uh, in their own words. I found I got insights reading this book. Okay. Definitely. De I mean, when reading, I, I had to read the um, their stories, and then I picked out the ones we were going to put in the book, a variety of different professions. And and for a lot of people older, for some of them, it's a relief because it explains why their relationships had problems. Now, um, yeah, but now all the people in my different, not less book, all had different jobs of all different kinds. I deliberately did not fill it up full of computer people. It's I've got them in there, but I've got lots of other jobs too. You know, and they and, and one of the reasons I got diagnosed later in life was relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can relate to that. And so. then the thing I think would be helpful is find even in 50, find friends through shared interests. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. I just talked to um, the, the yesterday about a young man that was interested in mountain biking. Well, you know, the seniors are probably not going to want to do that sport. But there's other things, uh, book clubs, things like that, you can do as shared interests. A lot of these people getting diagnosed in Germany. Yeah, were they're they, uh, they, retiring they, from jobs. Yeah, or shortly before that, I mean, you know, we didn't know anything about autism when we were kids at my age. And What is, um, what's the main thing that's causing them to get diagnosed at age 50? Relationships, German? problems, maybe. Yeah, just as okay. you said. And some are also pretty scared or afraid or, or frightened as far as the, the future is concerned. They don't want to be alone. They have relationships, problems. They never really maybe they didn't marry, you know, and now they're afraid they are going to be alone and they don't want to be alone. So they need to get 
they want to understand what went wrong in their lives. That's also a reason. Okay, I that, that, that that's Why true in the U.S. too. That's true. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the friends through shared interests is a really important thing. Hmm. They can find something to be interested. See, now I think in specific examples, and I went to an aircraft museum last year. You know, aviation something interests me, and there were a lot of seniors there. Some even that had to use a walker uh, that were docents who explained to the visitors at the museum about the different old aircraft that were there. Now, that's an example of a shared interest. And a lot of these um, old men were pilots at one time of these planes. And that I, I'm just seeing that. And I'm sure there were some there that were on the spectrum of a shared interest that seniors were having a good time with. I mean, that's, a, you see, my mind thinks in specific examples. So this was a senior activity that I saw last year, a big military museum on um, where the old pilots were explaining to people about all the different airplanes. <laughs> cool. And they also would talk to each other. But things where they can do some shared interest stuff yeah, so that there's uh, and and every day they went to the museum and they'd have their friends there and they'd talk to the public and and they might have been 70, 80 years old, some of them. And they had a life. We need to find more of those sorts of things. Yes. I've thought about what's gonna happen to me when I have to be on a walker and I can't travel. We have a science museum here. I'm probably gonna end up there explaining little physics experiments with ramps and things to little kids. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> because I've got to have something to do. Hmm. Um, hmm. And explaining, well, one exhibit there I really liked is it gave you an idea on energy. It was this box that had a crank on it that you cranked. And you could crank up the power. And if you put a LED light on it, it would go for a long time. You put... Um, uh, uh, a phone on it it would go for a long time but if you hooked it up to a hair dryer a heating element it got go and stop <laughs> and it was so so it sort of you know, taught how much you know the amount of energy it takes to run that dryer go <laughs> and the phone or the or the led light would stay on for a long time the use of electric power Okay, that, was that, was in, that museum that that uh, I think would be fun to explain to the kids on energy use that the heating element takes a lot of energy compared to the um, uh, an LED light or 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 foam. And my question is now: Is there anything that can help parents to accept the autistic trait? What can help that they can accept that their children can live with their autism the whole life? Well, the thing is, autism is a in the mildest forms is probably a personality variant in the most mild forms, and then you go into forms where they remain nonverbal. But some of those nonverbal people can learn to type independently and they'll describe scrambled vision. They'll describe problems with controlling move, move their movements. And so you have a, a child, let's say, gets six, six years old and doesn't talk. We start to teach them how to type. Yes. And they can learn to type on a tablet. And it's very important that the keyboard appears next to the print. They can't make the attention shift. Um, this is the thing. You have this huge spectrum. You know, if you were to look at all the people in the world, half the people in the world are going to be more cognitive and less emotional. And the other half are going to be more emotional and social. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then in the middle, you've got this huge variation in the middle. When does slightly being a nerd, so I hope you know what that word kind of means in German, or geeky, become autistic? There's no black and white dividing line. It's not like tuberculosis, having it or not having it. Mm. Um, and so you get these very mild forms that are personality variants, and then you get much more severe forms. It's a true continuous trait that merges finally into normality. In fact, even animals can have some of the trait. There's a really interesting paper called Solitary Mammals as a Model for Autism. So uh, you look right. at 
lions, for example, are more social than panthers and leopards when you look at the cat family. Ah, okay. uh, leopards got a, a, a disability. They're not as social. There's crossover with aut autism genetics. The What's solitary that? mammals like the panther and the leopard, as okay. opposed to the lion, is much more social. And the cats all have Asperger's syndrome. There's a book. Oh, with yes. Well, that's, um, yeah. yeah, I've seen that book. And I think that's kind of true. Mm -hmm. Now, the lions would have less Asperger's syndrome than the panthers and the leopards when you just look at the cat family of animals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. And lions, it's very, it's and very interesting. With genetics and, and some of the... Um, Hormones and things. I don't know why, but I prefer cats. To well, dogs. dogs are much more social. We <laughs> see, are dogs. I'm a cat. <laughs> very, very social. <laughs> I'm a cat. Are social and they're easy to train because they want to please us. Cats, you need to use food motivation for training. <laughs> I want to see these kids that are different um, succeed. Now, with the little ones, I look very severe at age two and three, very severe. Now I did not have epilepsy and that improves the prognosis. I can't emphasize enough the early intervention, but then after that, develop strengths. You may have somebody who's nonverbal, but they might be very good at art. Yes. You know, that, that is something that should be encouraged. There are some nonverbals very good at music. That needs to be encouraged. Yeah, lots of different things, so, so you can kind of see what they might be good at. Problem in Germany is we don't get a diagnosis before the age of five or something. No, they they if you've got two year olds are not talking, you get some grandmothers to work with this kid now. Mm, that's and what I have found that some grandmothers are really know how to work with these kids. And mm. let's say the child's lining up toy cars. Mm -hmm. Then we turned it into turn taking game. We take turns lining up the toy cars or the blocks, whatever they're lining up. We turn that into a turn-taking game to get them engaged. Oh, okay. And, but you don't mm. let these kids, just non-verbal kids, just sit in a corner and vegetate on electronics. I don't really care what the diagnosis is. You've already got one. Mm. The kid's not talking and doesn't socialize. And you need to do something about it and do something about it quickly. Mm. It's very good that you you say you you say that because here in Germany they all doctors are going to say, uh, this is gonna happen later. He's just a late speaker. He's a boy. Boys don't speak as fast as girls. Don't worry about it. You know it'll go away. And that's exactly what you say is a big mistake. We have to do something. That is a, a big minute. mistake. Okay. And I don't care. You know, let's say you have a kid with a bunch of physical things wrong with them too. The more you work with them, you'll find out what they can do. Like the early intervention is really important because the young brain is still growing. And, you know, you don't want to wait. If you get the kid talking, then you always give them an opportunity to use the words. And then you get a lot of kids where later on they get diagnosed, you know, mild autism and they're not learning enough skills, shopping and just basic things like that just mm -hmm. not learning them. And there's a lot of very creative people. Einstein was probably autistic. Mm -hmm. Yes. Einstein was autistic. Um, he spoke very late. Uh, Thomas uh, Edison, uh, Elon Musk is autistic. Yeah. yeah, Elon Musk, yeah. Greta Thunberg. Uh, and and then Steve Jobs. Yeah. How about Bill Gates? Bill Gates, probably. These are all very, very successful people that are probably on the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> but I want to ask one last question yeah. to to uh, Miss Granite. Do you still watch Star Trek? Do you still like it? Yes, I, I sometimes will get in a hotel room and find old Star Trek reruns, and I watch them. I loved Mr. Spock because he was logical, and in Star Trek: The Next Generation, I loved Data because he was logical. Yeah. Um. Um. The other thing that was good about those shows, they actually had some pretty good ethics in them. Yeah, I know. Very interesting topics, very spiritual, well, psychological. 
is Star Trek had a really inclusive clue, a crew. Look at all the different nationalities that were on the bridge of the Enterprise. Yeah, yeah, women and different and, colors. And different nationalities. Yeah, I know. I watch it right now, the first episodes. I've, w been w I've watched the first 12 again, and as a child, I used to watch all of them, and I love it. <laughs> well, when I was getting my master's in the, in the 70s, I had a blind roommate, and there was just one TV in the dorm down, and they always had football on it. So my blind roommate had a radio that would pick up TV signals. And we would watch Star Trek on the radio. We That's still great. called it watching, even though it was all audio. And the show was pretty good on the radio. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, and every Monday night, we'd uh, listen to it on the on her special radio that picked up um, uh, TV broadcasts. So you make your own pictures in your head when well, you we had that. Well, I knew what the pictures looked like, and yeah, right. um, and the show was it, it worked pretty well on the radio because <laughs> I knew what the sets looked like and. And I'm, uh, I'm. Um, um, that was something that my Gloria, my blind roommate, and I would do every Monday night. We'd watch Star Trek on her radio because <laughs> Monday night football was on in the in the <laughs> sitting room of the dorm. That's great. And despite for Mr. Spock, did you have another favorite crew member like Captain Kirk or Dr. McCoy? Was there I, anybody? Yeah, and I liked, you know, liked Mr. Spock best, but I liked all of the crew members. I mean, yeah, each all of them. had their personalities and, and um, you know, I really, really liked that show. That was a favorite show when I was in high school. Hmm. I'd never seen a Star Trek. Oh, you <laughs> have to. Oh, you need to see it. Yeah. You're gonna have, a lot of people on the autism spectrum love shows like Star Trek. To listen to you, it's it's uh, it's a gift for for us. Uh, thank you very much. So well, okay, well, I hope that I've given you some ideas that you know people can take home and use. Yes. And it's and been really great talking to you. And I'm going to leave the meeting now. And thank you very much for having me. Yes. Thank you so much for being so, with us. Okay. 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 Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.